A few videos ago, I built the Cant Cedar Landing Drop down in an area that I've called the jungle. Reversing back up the hill in the Badlands is the step up to wall ride called Bob's Bobsled. While these two features work fine on their own, it's not actually possible to ride from one feature to the next without getting off your bike. The problem is that just below the bobsled is what amounts to a mud pit. And we got the mud bog. To continue to the Cant Cedar Landing Drop, one must walk through this mud pit and up the hill after it. So to solve this problem, I've come up with a two-stage plan. The first of which we'll get to in a second. The second stage is a little more complicated. In order to preserve the speed coming downhill from the bobsled, we need a berm to redirect the rider left and with enough speed to make it up the hill. Since this area is so wet, digging a big dirt berm here would be out of the question. I needed to come up with something made out of wood. So, just like I did with the Cant Cedar Landing Drop, I scanned the mud pit with my phone to get a 3D model to work from. This way I could design something exactly that would fit within the limitations of the terrain. After iterating on a few different ideas, I settled on a design for a shark fin. It would have two distinct riding surfaces. The upper half would be a true shark fin, requiring the rider to air off the end. The lower half, at a shallower angle, would allow less experienced riders to ride the feature by rolling off the end. The lower half will also be decked with split rungs for more grip in the wet, while the upper section will consist of milled rungs for a more even, smooth surface that you can confidently lean into. The structure underneath all this will consist of five ribs, with each rib joined by beams. But before we get to building the shark fin itself, I needed to work on stage one, to get the mud pit rideable. Over the course of the last few months, I had cleared this area of logging slash and organic material that made it such a quagmire. It's now ready for the next step. So we're back in the mountain, and as you can see behind me, that's the exit of Bob's Bobsled. It's also raining, um, and uh, today's gonna be a muddy day, and that's because we're working on the mud bog at the bottom of the hill. So basically what I wanna do today is fill this area with rocks. And as you can see on this far end, I've already been doing a bit of work on and off, just throwing rocks in here when I can. So now that I have a fair amount of rock in the, the boggy section, I need to top it with a type of dirt. But we really need a good dirt that's gonna kind of shed water and, and not absorb it. So I found a spot with a, a really sandy dirt. So all this under this uh, fallen tree is all like really sandy. And this is perfect for what we need. The only problem is that we have to move it from here all the way down there. And that's what the wheelbarrow is for. And that wheelbarrow got a darn good workout. I must have gone up and down that darn hill a hundred times hauling loads of sand and rock. But sometimes that wheelbarrow worked me instead. The next day, it was time to install some pipe to allow the water to drain under the trail from the ditch I had dug from the high side. My pipe is doing its job. <laughs> Look, it's water. I feel really ridiculous about that, but it's just kind of satisfying when uh, everything starts to work. With that little success behind me, I could finish hauling rock and sand to make the whole section rideable. Well, I think I got the dirt part of this project more or less done. It was a lot of work, but I think it'll do a good job of dealing with the water in this area. Up here in British Columbia, it's part of mountain bike culture to build structures with wood sourced from the forest we're working in. The cedar trees we use are found in most parts of BC, are rot resistant, and easy to split into rungs. And although it's more labor intensive than just buying lumber at the store, it's cheaper and its aesthetic and longevity is a point of pride among trail builders out here. I wouldn't do it any other way. So with that in mind, it's time to harvest some wood from the forest. So today is wood getting day, and uh, I think it'll be a fun day. 
So I don't know if you can see, but there's a tree in there that's actually broken in half. That uh, really bright yellow one. And that's a cedar. And that tree was actually a gift from the last windstorm. It just blew over, snapped in half, and now we can use it to make some wood. And that tree that was all the way up there actually fell all the way to the road here. It's already been trimmed back a bit, but the top of the tree isn't that useful. But uh, the rest of the tree will be, even though it's split in half. So today we're going to start harvesting this tree. We're going to start cutting it up and uh, turning it into usable lumber. So now we're in the bush and you can see the, the tree split right in half. That's the power of the wind. And right up there is the rest of the stem. Normally we source our cedar from trees that have already fallen over. And with the top half of this tree broken off, it'll definitely be put to good use. But we weren't sure if we could take the part that was still standing. But after talking with the woodlot manager, we received permission to fall the rest of the tree since it was so badly damaged. But before we cut down the stem of the tree, the parts that had already broken off in the windstorm needed to be pulled from the forest. Chris and his truck would make short work of that job. With that taken care of, the goal would be to fall the rest of the tree where the previous pieces had fallen. And to cut such a large tree, we needed a chainsaw to match. This is my current chainsaw. With its 18 inch bar and light weight, it's perfect for general trail building. But it's not big enough to cut this tree down safely. And this is Bobby's saw. It has a bigger engine than some motorcycles. And with its 28 inch bar, this thing will make short work of most trees. Bobby was kind enough to loan it to us for the day. Since we wanted to follow the tree in the direction the other pieces fell, we made our first cut in the intended direction and about one third of the way into the tree. The second cut will take a notch out of the tree. This one is a little tricky to get right and it takes a bit of experience. I didn't line it up quite right the first time and went in for a second cut. With the undercut knocked out of the tree, I cleaned up the cut a little. I added what is called a snipe to help the tree fall in the direction I wanted it to go. The final cut is the back cut, which is slightly above the first cut and leaves two or three inches of wood uncut. This uncut wood creates a hinge and will help the tree fall in the correct direction. Then it's just a matter of using some wedges to force the tree to topple over. Well, at least that's the plan. Not quite. <laughs> there it goes. Almost. Jeez, man. I'm running out of wedges here. Nope. <laughs> it's so close. I hear it. Yeah. Come on. Push it. <laughs> there, we there we go. There we go. Yeah! And I dropped exactly where I wanted it to go. <laughs> Sick. Nice. <laughs> One thing I gotta say is this sawdust, it smells so good. <laughs> it smells so good. With our prize now on the ground, Chris cut a three foot round for us to split out into rungs. So now that we got this piece cut up, I'm just gonna split it in half along this point and uh, that way we can uh, more easily work on it. It would soon become a rung splitting party, resulting in a large pile of lumber to be used as the lower decking on the shark fin. Chris also cut off a narrow round with a big knot in it. It would be a good opportunity to count the tree rings to see how old it is. 148. Holy crap. Yeah. 
Chris then cut out a few more rounds and used his truck to pull up the rest of the broken tree onto the road. The next day I returned, still armed with Bobby's saw. It was time to swap out that measly 28 inch bar for a 36er. And that's because I'll be using an Alaskan mill to cut some perfect boards for the upper half of the shark fin. After using some hardware store lumber as a guide to create a straight first cut, <laughs> I could then cut 2.5 inch thick boards. Look at this beautiful board. So it's just one piece of wood right now, but it could actually potentially be six pieces if you divide it into three this way and chop it down the middle. So uh, yeah, we're actually making a lot more than it looks like here. With all the materials acquired for the job, it was time to start work on the shark fin itself. And remember that 3D design I created at the start of the video? Well, I loaded that up into an augmented reality app, allowing me to see how the feature would look in real life. I could adjust its position in real time, allowing me to get it exactly in the right spot. This would allow me to place a flag where each post was located in my design. I then dug a hole at each flag. With Chris and Bobby coming out to help, we could get to work on framing out the shark fin. With the area being so wet, we're going to be using concrete to cement each post into place to ensure the feature doesn't shift or rot. With a patty of concrete at the bottom of each hole, and each post wrapped for additional protection against rot, Bobby and Chris would then place each post while I guided them to the correct angles using my phone. Okay, Chris, a little lower. That's pretty good. Okay, a little bit to your left, Chris. Yeah, a little more. Do this. had all five ribs fully framed out. Over the next few days, I braced the bottoms of each rib together to prevent them from spreading under the weight of the whole structure, and installed beams along the course of the fin. The next day, it was time to install the split rungs on the lower half of the shark fin. Yuka was there to help hammer some nails, and she also provided some snacks. Donuts? I'm Donuts Lady. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Bottom's finished! Yeah! <laughs> Looks pretty cool. Bumpy though. The next step would be to cut my milled boards down into more narrow rungs so I could deck a less bumpy high side of the fin. I was a little worried I wouldn't have enough to cover the whole thing, but once I laid them out, I realized that I actually had more than I needed, giving me a little more flexibility. So now that we've laid out the rungs on the shark fin, I think we have an opportunity to make it even bigger. So the original plan was that it wouldn't go much higher than this point but obviously we've got so much extra wood and uh, I think we can make it work. After spending a little time modifying my design the shark fin would go from medium to large. So after modifying my design a little I think we can add a little extra to the top of the wall ride to make it a little bigger and to do that we just gotta add some beams back here to give something for the rungs to to rest on 
And uh, yeah, I think it'll work. And with that... rungs nailed into place, there would be one final touch to finish off the feature. And there we have it, one complete shark fin. an untold amount of hours to get this area to this point, and it's not even done yet. The entrance to the fin still needs to be filled in, and I still need to make a proper landing. So make sure you're subscribed, so you don't miss the next video, where we'll complete those tasks and ride the shark fin for the first time. But until then, check out the playlist below for the rest of the videos in this trail building series. As always, Thanks for watching and stay gnarly.